Grace Community Church in Edenbridge. I do hope you're keeping well and safe. There's been a few changes since I last spoke to you a few weeks ago, not least of which is the weather today. Um, over the last several weeks, we've been talking through the book of 1 Peter. And today I'm going to look at 1 Peter 4, verse 1 to 11. And using the themes that Peter describes here in this section of his book, I've called this talk Living for God, Suffering, Sober Thinking and Serving. So we've got three S's there. And this part of Peter's letter is sandwiched in between the um, title for middle of chapter three, which is Suffering for Doing Good and the title for the middle of chapter four, which is suffering for being a Christian. So living for God sounds a lot better than suffering. But when we look at verse one of 1 Peter 4, then we see it's all about, you've guessed it, suffering. So let's have a look at that. So this is 1 Peter 4, verse one and two. It says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Now, suffering is something that Christ himself went through, obviously, on the cross, and we could say that suffering for doing good is a Christ-like attitude. But you've got to be careful here. I remember I had a friend, um, a Christian friend many years ago, who thought that his depression that he was going through was actually a good thing because it meant he was suffering and then he could relate that to the suffering of Jesus. And that was a bit of a convoluted, weird way of looking at it. And I'm convinced that actually our loving father does not like us to suffer. We do suffer, everybody suffers, we are bound to suffer, I'm afraid, but it's not the will of the Father. The important thing is how we react to that suffering. What do we do when the suffering comes? And we have the big, big advantage if you're a Christian, you have a big, big advantage here because you have the Holy Spirit living in with, with you, living in you, who can help you in that suffering. So this theme of suffering uh, is throughout 1 Peter, Peter's book, but also um, it crops up a, little, a bit more later in this talk as well. But what else do we need to try to understand so that we can live for God. Well, sometimes I think it's easier to think about living for God when we think about what our lives were like before we became Christians. And I always remember um, at our church in Biggin Hill, we used to have men's breakfasts. So a group of men would gather together, Christians and non-Christians, and in that uh, breakfast, one or two people would stand up and tell everybody else about how they become a, became a Christian. And I did that on one occasion, or a couple of occasions, in fact. And the other person that was speaking at that um, particular meeting, I always remember, was Big Rob. Now, I don't know if any of you knew Big Rob. If you were at uh, Biggin Hill, you might have done. He was Big Rob because he was big. Um, <laughs> And he used to be a bouncer. And interesting thing, before he was a Christian, he said he actually really enjoyed getting into fights outside the nightclub that he was bouncing um, on. And he enjoyed hitting people. He also was into drugs and was um, having many, many sexual encounters. And he had problems with his life, not surprisingly. And at one point he got to such a low ebb that he actually called on Jesus and Jesus came into, came into his life and he was transformed. 
So living for Jesus, living for God, can transform us. Now, your uh, transformation and my transformation, probably not that dramatic in, as Rob's. But if we give our lives to Jesus, then Jesus will change us. And if you don't know that yet, you can pray that Jesus will come into your life. And he will. And Peter, in his letter, reminds his readers about their pre-Christian life as well. In verse 3 and 4, it says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless and wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Now, when doing some research for this talk, I came across my current favourite uh, writer, Phil Moore, and I'm going to quote from him, as I have done before, so if he can say it better than I can. I can't see why I shouldn't quote from him. And he says in his book about Pete, uh, Peter's book, he says, in 4.4, Peter says that unbelievers will be astonished when they see us living out our new story. That's the irony when people hope to win converts to Christ by blending in with the crowd. And I've heard of people who've tried to do that and it's, they've come a cropper. Peter tells us that we can influence people if we are willing to lose friends by sticking out like a sore thumb. People ought to be surprised by the way we work hard when the boss is not looking. People ought to be surprised by the way we say no to some of our sexual desires. People ought to be surprised that we spend our free time reading the Bible and sharing our lives with people who aren't like us. People ought to be surprised that we voluntarily lower our standard of living in order to be able to give large sums of money away. People ought to be surprised that we squander some of our precious holiday time on mission trips and discipleship con conferences. People ought to be surprised um, that we consider prayer to be the answer for everything and drunkenness to be the answer for nothing. People ought to be surprised that we are honest to our own disadvantage and that we offer kindness to those who can offer nothing in return. In fact, says uh, Phil Moore, if people do not find our lives surprising, Peter warns us that we may not be walking on the death and resurrection road at all. So that is quite a challenge. Are people surprised at our behaviour? Are they seeing our good deeds and the way that we react to suffering and are surprised by it? Often people who are not Christians are reminded of their own sin when they see Christians and the way that they behave. And that can cause antagonism. And I'm sure that some of you, like myself, have been you know, the, the bad end of that antagonism towards Christians. And Peter is saying that as Christians, the accepted behaviour of people around us is not appropriate for us now. And he reminds us that we must not fall back into these ways in verse 7, where it says, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Now, some time ago, I did a talk on uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and one of the fruit, one of the fruits, if you like, is self-control. Um, and this fruit, along with all the other fruits, come from the Holy Spirit. We don't get it through our own efforts. We can't work through a self-improvement program to get closer to God and to live for God. We can't say, oh, look, I've got self-control, tick. I've got the next one in that list of the fruit is love, tick. 
joy, tick, peace, tick, patience, tick, and so on. We can only live for God by allowing the Holy Spirit to change us, to work through us. And when that happens, then we get the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, have you ever seen images of people walking around the, with sandwich boards saying, the end of the world is nigh? I remember seeing that uh, in my local high street when I was a boy, and I thought, oh, that, that guy's a bit of a joke. Um, but Peter isn't joking here. He's deadly serious. Now, nobody knows when the world is going to end. Not even Jesus knew when the world was going to end. But at the moment, some people might say, is feeling like it's getting there. So Peter is telling us to be clear-minded because the end is coming. Why do we need to be clear-minded? It's so that we can pray. Now, I don't know if you ever try to pray whilst you've got other things on your mind. Um, you might be in the middle of a, a prayer in, on a Sunday morning in, you know, in church and then you're suddenly thinking about what you can have for lunch. Okay, <laughs> I know, it does happen. Um, you might be worrying about different situations. It's very difficult to pray if you're not clear-minded. And one of the other things which causes us not to be clear-minded is alcohol. In fact, another translation for this verse says, be sober-minded. Now, I have to be careful here. I don't want to be a hypocrite because, as those of you who know me know, I make my own homemade wine. And although I give a lot of it away, I do also enjoy drinking it. But I think what um, Peter is saying here is that we shouldn't be going to excess in alcohol. There are some people I know who don't drink at all and do admire them. And um, drink will cause problems, as Peter himself says. Um, it can cause to uh, lead to debauchery, orgies and carousing. And some people, particularly young people, um, maybe it's not just young people, but particularly young people, seem to think it's a badge of honour to be off your head and behaving in an immoral way. And obviously alcoholism, dependency on alcohol, is a terrible thing which really ruins the lives of the alcoholic and the people around them. And in Ephesians 5.18, it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And the latest strap line for the coronavirus, remember it? It's not as catchy as the last one, but it is stay alert. And Peter is telling us the same thing here. Be alert, be clear-minded, and we can take heed of what he says as we rely on more and more on the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Now in the final section of Peter's letter for the, this part that we're looking at, um, Peter goes on from telling us what not to do, never a good thing really, and, but it tells us what we can do instead. So this is verse 8 to 11. It says, above all, Love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever, whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power for ever and ever. Amen. So just want to briefly go through these points that Peter makes about how to live for God. He tells us to love each other deeply. Now that's 
difficult. I can't manufacture a love, a deep love for you. You can't manufacture a deep love for, for me. It's a tall order. But if we appreciate and understand the love of the Father, then we are able to love each other deeply. And that's my prayer, that we understand and obtain the love of the Father more and more in our hearts. Peter reminds us that love covers a multitude of sins. Love forgives. Um, this fa most famous Bible passage about love is 1 Corinthians 13. But I think Peter was thinking about the question that he had for Jesus um, when he wrote this. In Matthew 18, 21 to 22, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't mean you count off how many times you've forgiven your brother or sister. And then when you get to 77, that's it. You're not going to forgive them anymore. It means you keep forgiving. There's no limit. Peter then goes on to say that we should offer hospitality. Um, this might be something as simple as making a cup of tea for someone, not something we can do at the moment, but we can ring people, we can talk to them on Zoom or Skype or whatever. And then Peter encourages us to use whatever gifts we have been given to serve others. Now, this could be a whole variety of different things. Uh, we can't all play a musical instrument, we can't all preach, but... We can all bring the word of God to a meeting, even a Zoom meeting. We can all pray. We can deliver shopping. We can deliver medication. There's all sorts of gifts that we can use. And Peter does remind us that when we say something, it's like speaking the very word of God. It sounds a bit heavy, but actually because we have the Holy Spirit in us, then that's something that we can do. Now, as um, a science teacher, I used to teach how to write up a, an experiment. You have a method, a result, a conclusion. And the result of living for God, it says, Peter says, is that God is praised. He says at the end of the section, to him, that's God, be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So in my conclusion, thinking about what we've looked at, looked at suffering. So suffering happens to Christians as well as non-Christians. How do you and I personally cope with suffering? Are we relying on the Holy Spirit to see us through? Being different, Christians behave in a different way to non-Christians. We should stand out like a sore thumb. And our good deeds should convict those who are not behaving in a moral way. Be sober-minded or clear-minded so that you can pray. And finally, serving others. Love, forgive and serve others so that you might bring praise to God. Thank you for listening. <laughs>